were in conversation with Suman Sena of Renew. Thank you very much for talking to Money Control. Uh, sustainability, energy transition is a big theme at the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum this year. Uh, what's your own sense of you know how we can balance these objectives with growth, especially for emerging economies? You know, actually, Chandra, that's a uh, that's a very oft asked question. Yeah. And to me, there is absolutely no con contradiction or conflict between development and sustainability. And I think in some ways, India is a shining example of that, right? And it sounds like a corny statement, but it's actually true. Because uh, India is really embarking, as we all know, on a very significant path towards greening our economy. And it's also good for the economy because it's bringing down power costs because renewables are cheaper, right? So it's, it's supposed to bring down power costs. Um, and also it fosters energy security because we obviously are able to then manufacture more things within the country. And eventually energy independence because we're also able to get green hydrogen and so on to replace our fossil fuel dependence. So actually, if you think about it, sustainability is absolutely the right thing to do for economic growth for all of the reasons that I just mentioned. And so there is absolutely no conflict between the two. And therefore, all countries actually around the world, India should actually be a real shining beacon to other countries that this is the path that that people need to follow. Right. Uh, so, you know, how is the commercial and industrial demand for renewable projects looking? What's your own strategy in this space? It's looking very good. The reason is uh, that a lot of corporates globally uh, are also feeling the pressure of uh, going green. There's pressure, pressure from their investors. There's pressure from uh, civil society. Uh, I'm sure kids of CEOs tell them, you know, mom, dad, what are you guys doing? Why aren't you greening your company faster? So that pressure is really building up, right? And so, therefore, um, there is, I think, a very significant move towards uh, decarbonizing of corporates as well that is happening. We are certainly seeing that in India as well now. Uh, a lot of our new PPAs that we are signing are actually with corporate customers. And uh, I think you'll see that happening more and more. Today, by the way, corporates are going for clean uh, electricity as step one. But eventually, there will be other opportunities for them to decarbonize their entire operations. And so, therefore, that will keep throwing up more and more opportunities which is why we're really beginning to see ourselves uh, at Renew uh, more as a company for decarbonizing rather than as a company just to make uh, clean electricity. Right. Um, uh, Renew Power has also signed the framework agreement with the government of Egypt to set up a green hydrogen plant in the Swiss Canal economic zone with an investment of $8 billion and a targeted annual production of 220,000 tons of green hydrogen. You've also formed a JV with l and and IOC in India for green hydrogen. So is this going to be an international play for your company? Yeah, look, there are two kinds of plays in uh, green hydrogen. One is obviously the domestic play. And, you know, the Indian government recently announced the National Green Hydrogen Mission as well, where they've allocated almost two and a half billion dollars to essentially make sure that this whole industry develops uh, in the country. For addressing the domestic Indian market, we have a joint venture, as you said, with Indian Oil Corporation and with Larson and Tugo, l &T, And that JV is meant to address all the uh, domestic requirements of green hydrogen. Having said that, green hydrogen will be a globally traded commodity. India itself is trying to position ourselves for uh, getting to a large amount of exports of green hydrogen from India. So you'll see that happening. So that's in some ways, those are kind of two different opportunities, but really uh, in some ways interlinked with each other. And then obviously we also see that there are many countries globally, uh, which will also offer opportunities for making green hydrogen in a fairly cheap way. And Egypt is one of those countries. Uh, it's by no means the only country. There are, of course, other countries as well. Egypt, I think, was fastest off the blocks because obviously the momentum of COP27 happening and so on, that allowed us to sign an agreement with them. Uh, it is a framework agreement right now where we're doing a lot of work in terms of studying uh, the exact costs and so on. We're doing a lot of feasibility studies. I think we're about 12 to 18 months away from taking a final investment decision. Uh, so I would not sort of... While those numbers are there, I think it's it's a little bit down the road. We still have to do a lot of work before we can actually make those investments. The government recently announced its green hydrogen mission. So do you believe the incentives are enough to spur investment? I think the short answer is uh, not necessarily. Uh, the reason being that green hydrogen is being seen by various countries around the world as being a terrific opportunity. And every country is trying to incentivize uh, green hydrogen. Um, you see in the U.S., for example, the subsidies for green hydrogen through the Inflation Reduction Act are phenomenal. Uh, so as an export destination, they'll probably be number one. Uh, the European Union is also trying to give subsidies within uh, the country to both de uh, 
drive demand as well as to foster production. Um, as are other countries like uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, Oman, Morocco, etc. They may not be giving direct subsidies, but they do have advantages of cheap land and, and so on. So, uh, so I think it really depends. Um, I would say that uh, it's a good start that the government has made. Uh, at least it shows their inclination to encourage green hydrogen. Uh, but I think eventually um, we'll have to see whether that is going to be sufficient or not. Right. Uh, the government has also scrapped the reverse auction for the wind energy sector. Will this be enough to help the sector? You know, I think the most important thing is that there needs to be demand uh, from uh, the utilities. Uh, we know that uh, demand is growing substantially, but that has to translate into actual demand through uh, into SECI, for example. Um, look, I think it's certainly a step in the right direction, and it's a very significant step in the right direction. Because now, instead of um, uh, everybody rushing into only the best areas in the country and then there being a lot of, uh, you know, land costs going up and a lot of uh, competitive, um, you know, uh, positioning in those areas, um, we now can have a much more broad-based development across all the windy states in the country. Um, and that allows the infrastructure on the transmission side to be used better as well. So I think all in all, it's a, it's a terrific move on the part of the government. Finally, Samant, you know, we are two weeks away from the budget. Your one big reform or one big reform dream that you have. You know, it's very interesting. Um, to be honest, there's so much the government is doing for our sector outside of the budget. That is very hard to just say this is what we want in the budget specifically. You know, so I, I, if I had to pick a number, I would just say uh, focus on taxation um, because um, that is something that can really spur a lot of capital investment. On that note, thank you very much for talking to us.